Hi everybody, welcome back to New Voices. Thank you for joining us, it's great to have you with us. I just wanted to say that the last two panels have been so insightful and engaging in thinking about connections between sculpture and literature. The fact that these two forms can transcend genres, formats and societies, and most importantly, that they can provide a platform to think about human experience and hardships are really interesting points for consideration. I particularly like Grace's analogy about the fragmentary nature of object histories. I think this understanding can bring us quite nicely to this afternoon's keynote address by Eleanor Dobson. Ellie, I'm delighted to have you um, to welcome you to the programme. So Ellie is Associate Professor in 19th Century Literature at the University of Birmingham, where she has worked since 2017. She predominantly teaches literature of the late 18th century to the present day with a particular focus on the fin de siècle, the Gothic, the natural world and gender and sexuality. Eleanor is the author of three books published in 2020. You've been very busy <laughs> writing the Sphinx Literature, Culture and Egyptology published by Edinburgh University Press, the edited collection Victorian Literary Culture and Ancient Egypt by Manchester University Press and Ancient Egypt in the Modern Imagination, Art, Literature and Culture by Bloomsbury. Ellie has also published Excavating Modernity, Physical, Temporal and Psychological Stratification in Literature, 1900 to 1930, which was published in 2018 by Rutledge. Her current project, A Second Monograph, is provisionally titled Victorian Alchemy, Science, Magic and the Ancient and Ancient Egypt. Eleanor's presentation is titled, Mr. Miller will draw it for you exactly as it was, stone, ink, and British Museum artifacts in print. Um, Ellie, we're delighted to have you join us today. Thank you so much. The floor is now yours. Lovely, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I had such an interesting morning scribbling hastily as people have shared their fascinating papers. And I think um, actually, People have touched on lots of topics that are of particular interest to me and I hope are going to um, suggest themselves as um, useful ways of thinking about uh, representations of British Museum artefacts. So we've heard about um, uh, in Beth's paper to start today, um, traces of you know millions of years ago as represented as physical objects, as moulds. Um, I'm interested in things a little bit closer to home, um, maybe thousands rather than millions of years. Um, but I think there's something about uh, printing with these objects and taking rubbings of these objects and making molds of these objects, um, which uh, speaks very much to representations of um, these far older things in Victorian culture. But I'm also super interested in the book itself as monument and uh, as a way to kind of physically commemorate other physical things. And sometimes this involves rendering the three-dimensional in two-dimensional ink. Um, we've probably all been to the British Museum. If you haven't been to the British Museum, um, you'll have seen pictures of things from the British Museum. Um, a hub where lots of sculpted artifacts from all around the world have been collected into one place. Um, and I'm struck as a literary scholar um, that to go around the British Museum and to look at these objects is also an exercise in literary history. So for instance, um, some of the canonical um, great British poets um, have been inspired by these artifacts either in situ or um, in newspaper reports as these uh, uh, objects have been discovered before they've then been transported to the British Museum. Um, so Clytie or Antonia, this um, marble Roman bust that you can see on the left here is the inspiration behind William Wordsworth's poem, The Egyptian Maid. And perhaps more famously, um, we have uh, the younger Memnon, a partial colossal uh, sculpture of the Pharaoh Ramesses II, uh, being oft cited as the inspiration behind Percy Bysshe Shelley's sonnet, Ozymandias. I'm particularly interested in ancient Egyptian objects because I think ancient Egyptian sculptural artifacts um, invite us to reassess um, uh, assumptions that we might make about what sculpture is that we have in turn inherited from um, classical Western civilization. So the, the same culture that produced um, the bust of Clytie. Um, I think this is because um, that we can often look at ancient Egyptian artifacts 
and see something that is not just sculpted image, but is also text. We don't often see this view of the younger Memnon, um, but I think this view is almost even more interesting than the front. Um, in what at first strikes us as, as a sculpted representation of a human, uh, a king, perhaps even God, um, it's also a textual record. And I think when we start looking from different angles, we can read something much more exciting for our purposes today. Um, maybe we're all biased because we're all interested in similar things. Um, but we can look at things from different angles and engage with them as um, not just sculptured or, or, or not just textual. Um, and it might be fun to do this with perhaps the most famous hieroglyphic um, text in the world, um, the artifact known as the Rosetta Stone. So nowadays, the way that we see the Rosetta Stone, the way that it is reproduced is almost always as this front view, um, which I think is a bid to render this um, sculpted artifact as um, text first and sculpture second. We see um, this artifact very much as a kind of two dimensional plane onto which text is inscribed. And in its various three texts is its um, archeological value or its primary archeological value. To look at the Rosetta Stone from this angle is disorienting. Um, I certainly wouldn't recognize it. Um, I'm sure most people wouldn't recognize it looking at it um, from either of the side views or indeed the back view. Um, but I think one of the, the useful um, things about looking at the Rosetta Stone from the side is that we recognize its chunkiness. We recognize its three dimensionality. Um, perhaps we might also look at how archeologists imagine the Rosetta Stone originally looked when it was first created in ancient Egypt a work which is very much sculpted, um, topped as well with decorative carvings, which add a pictorial element to something which we often um, read simply nowadays as text. So I hope ancient Egypt is a useful way into rethink, rethinking some of these assumptions we might have about the relationship between text and sculpture and between image and text. We've already seen on the reverse of the Younger Memnon um, the carved hieroglyphs, which fill um, what would otherwise have been blank surface. And if you look at ancient Egyptian sculpture more broadly, it's often the filling of blank space with text um, that avoids this um, kind of creation of negative space. We also see this on, um, on architecture. There's very few uh, architectural surfaces in ancient Egypt um, or from ancient Egypt that uh, don't have text written on them or image. Um, and even uh, uh, works that we don't necessarily think of as also textual, like the Great Sphinx of Giza, to take another really famous example. Um, we see the Great Sphinx and we see a colossal sculpture, a colossal statue. Um, fewer people know that there is in fact a tablet between the Sphinx's paws or up against its chest, um, which makes this work um, as much textual as it is um, sculptural, a, a work which commemorates um, the act of writing. And of course, one further element to, to complicate this relationship in ancient Egypt in particular is the fact that the hieroglyphic script is itself made up of several um, recognizable pictograms, which means that if you look at um, any of these carved sculptures that we've already seen, um, you're looking at um, images which are carved into broader texts, which then adorn larger sculptures. Let's use the Rosetta Stone as a springboard. Um, into an examination of one rare text, which is going to be um, what we start with this afternoon. Um, a rather inelegantly named text, very much the Ron Seal um, uh, school of titling here. It's called the Report of the Committee Appointed by the Philomathian Society, of the University of Pennsylvania, to translate the description on the Rosetta Stone. A rubbish title, I would say, doesn't capture the attention, but the cover is absolutely beautiful and what's inside is even more exciting, I think. Um, this is a historically significant work, which I don't think gets the attention it deserves. Um, it is the first full translation of the text on the Rosetta Stone, and it's one of the, uh, the few books in American publishing history which is produced entirely by lithography. In fact, it's often cited, and I'm not sure if it is true, um, but certainly cited um, fairly frequently as the first book in American publication history to be produced entirely by lithography. And lithography is a process by which um, 
uh, chemical etching is produced on the surface of the stone um, and grease is used to kind of mark out places which aren't to be inked and then um, uh, ink is produced on stone, stone surfaces and then paper is applied um, for the transfer of the ink. That's quite an old process by the 19th century. Um, this is a work which uses, um, I guess, quite modern, up-to-date uh, versions of lithography, though. Uh, once you get inside, it's very, very colourful, very um, strikingly colourful, in fact. Um, not necessarily what we'd imagine from a scholarly, archaeological, Egyptological text. From here, I want to look at a rather different work, um, but one which also relies upon a hieroglyphically um, inscribed artefact at its heart and is interested in that hieroglyphic relationship between image and text. This second book, which we're going to come on to later, is Edith Nesbitt's children's novel, The Story of the Amulet, published in 1906. And it also visually and textually reproduces British Museum artifacts. Um, in this case, not just one, um, but artifacts that range from ancient Egyptian amulets, um, small items to colossal artifacts from ancient Assyria. And this text, integrates these artifacts into an um, imaginative, magical narrative for children. What these two quite different sources have in common though, is um, the fact that they are both creative responses to British Museum artifacts. Um, and also milestones, I suppose, in the history of British Museum artifacts as they are rendered on the page. There's also a kind of playfulness at the heart of both writers, illustrators and scholars and people who are operating across those categories um, are imbuing these sculpted objects with um, new created products um, themselves. So they're historically significant, um, but I think we might read behind that playfulness um, something a little bit more sinister, something of the legacies of colonialism. So to imagine to take these artifacts, which have already themselves been removed from their original context and relocated to the British Museum, um, invites the imagination of polychromatic visual decorative devices um, that combine the Egyptian with something that feels much more European. Um, and similarly, the story of the amulet seems very much aware of how it is rewriting and representing these artifacts. Um, which have been removed from their original time, removed from their original place, and are being represented um, from their stone originals into two-dimensional ink renderings. So if we look at the image on the left, I think we get a sense already that this is going to be quite an exciting Egyptological work. We're presented with um, a highly ornamental, it does feel very Victorian actually in the kind of um, the lilies, the water lilies, um, the kind of visual feast. Um, the Victorians aren't known for kind of minimalism. So here we get um, that very highly ornamentalized cover. And of course, um, there is perhaps a little joke going on here in that we don't have the title on the cover. The only text that we have is hieroglyphic. And so when we encounter this book, we are in the same position as um, Napoleon Bonaparte's French soldiers as they first unearthed the Rosetta Stone in that we are presented with hieroglyphs and that to us, these hieroglyphs are unreadable. Of course, the authors of this work, three American students go on to um, produce the first translation, so we can read it. Um, but I think from the, from the book's cover page, we're presented with something that is um, very much a creative as much as scholarly exercise. To open the book is to get that first glimpse of um, the multicolored text inside. Um, we have uh, each of these colors, the inks, of course, produced um, uh, in separate layers in the chromolithographic process, which means that it's going to take absolutely ages. This is a book with um, dozens of pages. It's not a short or small text. Um, and I think the choice of lithography is such an interesting one. You're in a little bit of a pickle if you're trying to produce a hieroglyphic text in the mid 19th century. Hieroglyphic typefaces haven't been produced yet, so there's nothing that's going to attempt to save you time. But even if you are going to put together a typographic hieroglyphic text, it's going to be very fiddly. So I think what happens here is the authors say, OK, we'll, we'll use lithography um, to reproduce these. We, we'll have to hand draw those signs individually onto stone. And they think, well, while we're at it, we might as well add some color. We might as well add some illustrations. Um, 
and the result is a copy of 400, um, well, 400 copies of this text. Um, and sadly, after they've spent so much time illustrating, handwriting, um, and hand coloring all of these pages, is that the very next year there is demand for a second edition, by which time, of course, the lithographic zones have been reused. Um, so they have to start again from scratch. And so um, if you compare the two versions, some of the illustrations have been reproduced um, and some of them have been um, you know, you know, entirely new illustrations. Um, so it is a really interesting and rare um, book. One can only imagine how the authors felt that day they were told they needed to produce the second edition. But I think there are, there are kind of jokes going on from the very first page. Again, we, we see the title of the book, but we can't quite read it because they've rendered it as if it is written on a curtain. Um, and the authors and illustrators seem um, very interested in, um, in the stone surface, as static, as hard, but also in this title page, in flowing soft surfaces. And we get this queen or goddess figure peeking behind the curtain as if to get um, a sneak peek at the uh, secrets of the Rosetta Stone that these students are going to reveal. The Rosetta Stone's actually, the text of the Rosetta Stone is quite boring. It's a kind of rather dry historical record. Um, so actually, um, to most people, I would suggest, it's the visual accompaniments that are the real interesting thing here in this work, not the text of the stone itself. This is what the lithographic process looked like. So it is very much um, a process that involves um, lugging around hefty blocks of stone. It's a very manual process. Um, and I wonder if um, the artists, the illustrators, the uh, publishers, familiarity um, around huge blocks of stone means that when they do represent the Rosetta Stone, we don't get that front on image. We get an image of the Rosetta Stone that really underscores the fact that this too is a great big bulky block of stone. We get that three dimensionality emphasized here. We also get the Rosetta Stone captured within this arch-like aperture and I wonder if also there is a suggestion here of the original artifact as it existed um, and now only exists in archaeological reproductions. Um, so something of the Rosetta Stone's ancient history perhaps suggested in that shape. And of course on the opposite page we get something that doesn't feel particularly Egyptian at all. We get this spray of fern leaves. There's a big fern mania going on in 19th century culture and so the fern becomes quite fashionable. So we have in the rectangle the beginning of the kind of modern history, the imperial history of the French discovery of the Rosetta Stone, um, surrounded by iconography that feels European, that feels non-Egyptian, which recontextualizes this object in a modern European history. That's not to say that these decorative motifs as they appear throughout this book are entirely divorced from content. And I think there is a playfulness at work here that we can read in some of these decorations. Um, this one, which is purely for the sake of writing the subtitle, the Rosetta Stone, that particular part of the book is adorned with a very um, detailed ring of roses. Um, this is, uh, in my opinion, a visual pun. Um, the Rosetta Stone is called the Rosetta Stone because it was found in the Egyptian town of Rashid, which the Europeans would not call by its Egyptian name, but which they renamed Rosetta. Um, Rosetta or Rosette is first the Italian and then the French um, for uh, Little Rose. And so what we have here is a pun which uh, alludes to the language, the, the naming of the Rosetta Stone, but one which also um, emphasizes a linguistic Europeanness at the expense of an Egyptian context, um, which I think is interesting if you are um, attentive to imperial history. This page is also interesting to me, um, and hopefully to all of us, in that the lithographic process also reproduces the three handwritten signatures of the, uh, the students who produced this book. Um, and I think one of the things that we, uh, that we get here that we lose with um, movable type is um, that kind of anonymization of the author's hand. Um, it's hiding behind um, the metal and the mass produced. And here we get something of um, the individuals behind the book. And we see all three different um, uh, authors' handwritings. 
as you go through the volume. And handwriting and signatures um, is also going to be of interest to us in Nesbitt's work when we turn to that. But before we do, I want to look at just a few more pages um, from this book, which I think seem to revel in that self-aware um, understanding of the um, indivisibility of the sculptural and the textual in ancient Egyptian culture. So we have a book which is um, beautifully colored in most places, really, um, really bright primary colors um, for most of the book. Um, but we, here we have um, a rather unusual instance of brown ink being used. And I think what we're presented with here in the use of brown ink is um, the disguising of the page in order to evoke stone. We get that um, steely shape as well, of course, the original shape the Rosetta Stone would have been. Um, and we get um, picked out in uninked places, um, as well as high, um, I guess, created with shadow with the, the black ink, is what looks to be um, a mimicking of carved relief with highlights and with shadows. And equally, again, in those blank spaces, um, the, uh, the application of, of tiny hieroglyphic symbols. Um, hieroglyphs were um, one of several ancient Egyptian writing forms. Hieroglyphs were um, used in carved documents, in religious um, and historical documents that were meant to last. Um, if you were handwriting, you wouldn't write in hieroglyphs. And so to handwrite these hieroglyphs is to mimic um, the process of, of chiseling into stone um, in a rather self-conscious way. I'll show just a couple more pages of this um, that struck me as interesting before we move on to Nesbitt. Um, the example on the left um, is intriguing to me in that it does that kind of dazzling um, multicolored work, which would have taken so many different prints and would have been so time consuming. Um, but what particularly intrigues me here are the two figures kind of on either side of the text midway down the page. These to me look like ancient Egyptian representations of scribes. Um, and so there seems to be something rather self-conscious going on here. Um, on the left, we have a scribe who is holding um, a reed pen and um, the, uh, the scribe's palette. And perhaps this scribe is just in the act of, of um, uh, painting those hieroglyphs onto the wall behind him. They're all in the same colored ink, which perhaps suggests they're all his work. On the right, we have perhaps another scribe, somebody who is holding what appears to be um, papyrus, a papyrus text. So another instance of this self-conscious evocation of um, ancient Egyptian writing practices um, to complement the modern, the very modern modes of production that are at work here. And again, that very European motif of a cluster of what appears to be acorns at the bottom of the page, just to make sure this isn't too Egyptian. Most interesting of all to me um, is the next page, the one on the right. Um, which is the title page before the actual translation of the Rosetta Stone text begins. And what we have here on this page is um, an aperture, which is ancient Egyptian. We have um, rock, which has been carved to represent um, very recognizable ancient Egyptian iconography, the winged solar disc at the top there. And onto this stone is being carved um, modern English text, the word translation, which is being done is being carved as we look on by um, a Western man. We have three Western men here. Um, unfortunately, I can't find um, images of any of the three authors, but I wonder, it's so tempting to read this image in particular as a, a kind of self-portrait of the three of them um, rewriting, um, re-sculpting ancient Egyptian material to be readable. Um, to be comprehensible to modern uh, European and specifically Anglophone uh, readers. So a text which is at once um, playful, which is at once um, self-aware, uh, but which also throughout which is this thread of imperialistic um, appropriation of refashioning the Rosetta Stone into a European artifact, into a British Museum artifact. And I think we're going to see this too in um, in Nesbitt's text. So we'll turn to something which is, in many ways, a very different kind of literature, a text which isn't produced for, you know, originally 400 um, institutions 
of Egyptological enthusiasts and scholars, but is instead produced for a child readership. This is E. Nesbitt's story of the amulet. Um, it's again another work which takes one particular artifact um, as its inspiration. Uh, this text was first published in the Strand magazine. It was serialized from 1905 to 1906, and then it's published in novel format in 1906. Um, obviously very different modes of production from the lithographic text. Um, I think what we're seeing here is, is rather more straightforward engravings um, of uh, uh, images which are just produced in black ink. Um, we are presented with an artifact and images of an artifact in both versions of the text. We have the strand version where we see this tiny little, um, quite hastily drawn, um, it appears to me to be at least, um, squat little artifact with a kind of vague humanoid shape. Um, I wonder if that's Nesbitt herself doing a quick sketch rather than her illustrator. I wonder if it's um, the illustrator drawing just from um, uh, just from a kind of uh, description from Nesbitt as opposed to anything more concrete. But certainly by the time the novel version of the text comes out, we get something that looks far more akin to a scientific line drawing rendered on the page. And um, one of the great things about this second illustration, the rather more controlled, rather more detailed drawing, is that it means we can identify the original in the British Museum. Um, I think that's similar enough for it to be fairly conclusive, hopefully. Um, this uh, artifact on the left is um, a kind of amulet often referred to as an Isis buckle. Um, it is often uh, carved into either red or green stone. Um, here we see a rather um, beautiful red example. And as you can see, onto the surface of the amulet is inscribed um, in two columns hieroglyphic text. Now Nesbitt, when she uh, was working on this novel, uh, she consulted a friend of hers, the uh, Egyptologist E.A. Wallace Budge, who was the uh, then the keeper of Egyptian and, and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum. These are lumped together into one group. Um, and it's likely that Budge suggested um, some of the premise behind the story, and it's likely that Budge also showed Nesbitt this particular amulet. Um, now Budge produced, um, he was very prolific in terms of the books that he wrote, but one book in particular is called Egyptian Magic. And the reason why this book is so interesting is because in Egyptian Magic, he um, lists all of the different kinds of amulets that were common in ancient Egypt. Um, and he also includes um, small uh, hieroglyph-like illustrations of those amulets. And in fact, most ancient Egyptian amulets didn't just exist as small sculpted objects, but also existed as a kind of hieroglyphic pictogram as well. So when we read Egyptian magic and we, we read um, the part of the text about Isis knots um, or Isis buckles, we realize um, that what we are looking at here is um, a hieroglyph petrified, a hieroglyph rendered in stone onto which other hieroglyphs are inscribed, which is rather satisfying and complicated. One thing you'll have noticed is that the hieroglyphs on the original are not reproduced in the line drawing in Nesbitt's text. And that is because um, uh, Nesbitt enlisted Budge with the task of writing a new hieroglyphic incantation for her, for her own amulet. Um, this is the, uh, the inscription that Budge wrote for her. At the beginning of the text, when we first encounter this, we're not meant to be able to read it, um, but there is a translation that comes later. And it's a magical inscription. It's, it's an inscription when um, once you read it aloud, you can use the amulet's magic. And that magic involves um, allowing the children protagonists to travel backwards and forwards in time, um, including to various ancient civilizations. Now, as you can see here, one of the children, um, Cyril, says that it's not writing. It's pictures of chickens and snakes and things. Um, this is very common to um, particularly children's literature in which hieroglyphs are represented. Um, there's a real comedy um, in the fact that these, um, the ancient Egyptian writing system isn't utterly unreadable. We can read something in there. Um, we can read that some of these are birds and we can read that some of these are snakes. Um, and sometimes that has meaning and sometimes it doesn't. Um, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, some of them are um, phonetic signs with a phonetic value. 
Some of them are determinatives, which mean um, if you see uh, a particular sign, it means that the word that comes before it has a kind of meaning associated with that pictogram. Um, so if you see um, hieroglyphs and then a little man, you know that that's a man's name that comes before it, that kind of thing. So there is something that we can read here. Not enough, of course, but still something. And I think that's why there is the appeal um, often in children's lit. What intrigues me as somebody who's interested in, in textual production is that this looks very much like handwritten hieroglyphs. There's no attempt to make this look like hieroglyphs as they were carved, which are much more, usually much more regular. Um, and I think what we have here on the page is a, a, a mass reproduction of Budge's handwriting, the actual handwriting of the Egyptologist, not the author, not the illustrator, but a third party who is um, a scholar and an expert. Um, the reason I think this is because if you compare it to Budge's handwriting, and this is an example from much later, so perhaps his handwriting has changed a little bit. Um, I think we nevertheless see some of those sweeping lines, some of the rapidity of, of writing by hand, which hieroglyphs weren't um, really rendered in, to be honest, um, but also perhaps in the example of the twisted flax, there's something of a similarity there in that particular symbol. Um, I'm going to have to do some more digging to see. Um, if I can say definitively that that's Budge's handwriting. But I think this very much reads as handwriting rather than inscription. Even if this is rendered a little bit more regularly, um, we'd be able to tell that this is um, very much a Western invention rather than an ancient Egyptian original. Um, we've already seen the amulet, of course. So we know that if you're going to put hieroglyphs on that amulet, you can't draw them in a, in a kind of linear across fashion. It has to be in columns. But here we're encouraged um, to see this text as something that can be read by Western eyes. Um, so it's written um, across. And it's also written from left to right. Um, you can see in the example of Budge's handwriting there, all of the animals and um, humanoid figures that he's drawn face to the left. Um, and the way you know how to read hieroglyphs, whether you read them from left to right or right to left, because it's both also um, top to bottom, um, is you follow the direction in which um, where you read towards the way the animals and the humanoid figures are facing. So in all of these examples, and the one on the left is Budge teaching somebody to read hieroglyphs, the way that you teach an English speaker to read hieroglyphs is to show them from left to right. Um, ancient Egyptians usually use right to left, um, and certainly Arabic speakers who learn hieroglyphs tend to learn from right to left because that's just what we're accustomed to. Um, so the example that we have here looks very much like a westernized um, hieroglyphic script. Nesbitt isn't just interested in ancient Egyptian artifacts, though, and I'm reminded um, when we come to um, artifacts from the ancient Near East more broadly, that Budge's domain in the British Museum is Egyptian um, artifacts, but also um, in a, a broader sense, um, artifacts from across the ancient Near East. So again, um, artifacts of which he has um, direct expertise. Um, and I'm struck by the fact that this text seems to have perhaps a little bit more of a self-awareness than the Rosetta Stone translation of um, the very fact that all of these artifacts that have been amassed in the British Museum from all over the world, but particularly from across ancient Near Eastern cultures, is um, to remove them from their original time, to remove them from their original place, and for that to be a kind of imperialistic process. So there's one part of the text where again we get a textual and visual representation of other artifacts. And this is the kind of um, the most dense part um, in which these artifacts are encountered altogether. When the children have used the amulet to bring the ancient Babylonian queen to modern London. Um, and the queen sees all of these artifacts from her own culture in the British Museum and wishes that all of those uh, Babylonian uh, things would come out to me here slowly so that those dogs and slaves can see the working of the great queen's magic. And of course, this magic um, happens. Um, the glass swing doors were smashed suddenly and completely. The crowd of angry gentlemen sprang aside, but the nastiest of them was not quick enough. And he was brushly pushed off out of the way, possibly, out, that's meant to say, by an enormous stone ball that was floating steadily through the door. It came and stood beside the queen in the middle of the courtyard. And what follows is a list of lots more things um, that are 
Assyrian in origin, rolling pins with marks on them like the print of little bird feet. That's um, the uh, Assyrian writing system. Um, and of course, in the illustration by H.R. Miller, we get um, the two, let's see if I can move this slide on. There we go. We get the two um, Assyrian stone um, human headed uh, bull figures, uh, which are being referred to here. So again, uh, the implication that not just Nesbitt has been to the British Museum to look at these artifacts and use them as inspiration, but that her illustrator, um, H.R. Miller, has also been doing the same himself and drawing um, at the museum uh, for his primary uh, materials. There is lots of evidence to suggest that this is in fact the case and Miller is going to the British Museum. And I think there are other instances in which we can read specific British Museum artifacts as being rendered in his illustrations. Um, this image is one of um, a, uh, a Syrian god who uh, materializes before the children. And I think, as we can see here, there are enough similarities between the details. We can see um, the beads in the bird deity's hair. We can see the kind of tasseling and fringing on his, um, on his clothing um, to suggest that, uh, that Miller is, is using this particular artifact as his inspiration. And I think it's intriguing that this, this text is especially interested in um, the Near Eastern, ancient Near East and the, the ancient Near Eastern artifacts, um, because like the ancient Egyptian artifacts, we can see if we um, approach this particular artifact from a different angle, not only is it utterly three-dimensional, despite usual two-dimensional renderings, um, but also that the text itself, that the, the writing system um, is used to fill blank space, and even um, if we look at that picture, if we look at the, the kind of lower band of what appears to be texture across the lower half of the figure, that is actually also more writing. So the writing is actually inscribed over image um, in this example. So in Miller's uh, depiction of this ancient deity, we get a figure which has been um, almost removed from um, the three-dimensional or, or two di well, two-dimensional renderings of three-dimensional stone and removed from the text um, to become fully embodied. I thought I would show just one more example. There are loads more, but for the sake of time, just one more example, um, where Miller has used a particular artifact um, in his images. And I think this really um, anchors um, his rather fanciful magical illustrations in a kind of fact here. Um, but this image, I think we can see a little bit more of a kind of creative interpretation. And again, that playfulness, if we look at the original, his expression, the expression of the king who is represented in this sculpture, wears a rather somber expression. And if we look at Miller's, there is a kind of amused smile on his face as the children who are traveling through time visit the British Museum in the future to see if they can find their amulet there. And of course they can. But this image also strikes me as intriguing because we see um, on the stone base of um, the statue, um, Miller's signature and the date 1905, which suggests that he is um, taking an object from antiquity and bringing it up to date in his very own modern moment. More so that he is not just illustrator here, he is sculptor. He is carving his own name into the stone um, rendered in ink on his illustration. This is something, oh yes, there's the error. This is something that, that Nesbitt herself is um, attuned to, I think, this um, tension between the carved and the written um, that is so central to the artifacts that she, she kind of creates, weaves her narrative around. Um, and I will uh, draw things to a close with just one more quotation and one more moment in her text. This is a text which is interested in ancient history. Um, there's a lot about it that is archaeologically accurate because she's consulting Budge, um, of course, and is probably doing lots more archaeological reading. But it's also a narrative about magic. It's a children's fiction. It's an adventure story. Um, and they go to lots of real ancient civilizations as well as the future. Um, but they also, as they travel back in time, go to Atlantis and encounter Atlanteans. And I think, um, one of the most intriguing moments, which seems to uh, be rather self-aware in terms of um, uh, image production 
and sometimes textual production in uh, the early 20th century is um, one uh, encounter in which the children are talking to an Atlantean and they say that um, all of their knowledge of their adventures is going to be written up um, into a book. What, asks the captain, is a book? A record, something written for one of the children, explains, remembering the Babylonian writing, or engraved. So to aid in the Atlantean's understanding of what a book is, the child shows him the amulet, an ancient Egyptian artifact sculpted, it turns out, from Atlantean stone, which itself comes to represent the concept of book in this moment. Um, another moment, of course, which is rendered um, by H.R. Miller. What I hope to have shown this afternoon are a couple of instances in which sculpted artifacts from ancient Egypt and the Near East more broadly have invited creative engagements that seek to reproduce them both textually and in illustrative material that pays homage to stone, carving, engraving and printing. To produce an Egyptological work or a children's novel based around these stone images is itself a creative process. Once these artifacts have been removed from their original context, they come to mean new things to those who encounter them. Um, and they're inscribed onto these artifacts are sometimes literally the signatures of authors, illustrators, and scholars, which suggest play as much as the sinister processes of imperialism. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. That was so interesting and insightful, and the visuals are amazing. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. While um, we wait for our attendees to post questions in the chat, I'm going to use my chair's privilege and ask a question myself. So you mentioned that Miller and Nesbitt visited the British Museum and made illustrations or studied these objects and then incorporated them into their work. And I myself, I found a similar scenario with George and Mary Watts. Um, Interesting. Artists, um, of the Victorians as well. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak about the broader context about um, the 19th century and Britain's fascination with Egypt. And um, why do you think the Victorians are so fascinated by these objects and by these histories? Interesting. Um, I suppose earlier in the 19th century, it's very much um, a matter of kind of national pride. Um, so when the French um, under Napoleon Bonaparte uh, invade Egypt, Egypt it's in an attempt to stop the British having easier access to India. So it's to kind of put the spanner in the works with, with British trade um, and with Brit the British economy and with the British Empire. Um, and the British go in and defeat the French. And over the course of the century, um, there is this kind of buying, not just the kind of imperial or military dominance in Egypt, but also a cultural one. Um, so Egypt becomes, I guess, the gateway to the East. Um, a really useful trade route. I mean, we saw with the Suez Canal when that that, that poor ship blocked it, um, that the world's trade, just just an enormous in, um, impact and how the Suez Canal, which was created um, in the mid, well, I suppose, I guess, towards the second half of, of the 19th century, um, just revitalizes um, and changes the world economy on an enormous scale. So I think there's, there's a kind of imperialistic pride in the fact that the, the British had gone in and stopped the French from, um, from occupying and dominating Egypt, but were then basically dominating Egypt themselves. So Egypt becomes very fashionable. Um, I think there's um, another way in which um, Egypt is always, I suppose, always in Western culture since ancient Greece and Rome has always been seen as, as exotic um, and fascinating. And so you see Egyptian obelisks transported to Rome. Um, and then the British and the French transport obelisks, they want their own. So we get Cleopatra's Needle in London, again in the second half of the 19th century. So I think Egypt represents imperial might. Um, it represents a kind of magical ancient culture. Um, and I don't think we've ever really lost that sense of magic with Egypt, even after the translation of the Rosetta Stone, which is a very interesting document. <laughs> It's still mysterious. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, we actually have a question coming from Grace. Um, she's saying, I'm wondering if you think the pictorial representations of writing contributes to the proliferation of Egyptology, Egypt mania in children's books more generally. I feel like I grew up on a steady diet of Egypt related things, horrible histories, etc. 
Is it because of the Victorians and to make children good little colonial subjects? Or is it something about the interplay of pictures and writing that facilitates children who are learning to read in a fun way or something else entirely? It's a really good question. That's such an interesting question. I also loved the awful Egyptians book in the Horrible Histories <laughs> series. I think, um, oh yes, the big gold Egypt book. I think it's called Egyptology, absolutely beautiful. Um, there is a way in which Egypt appeals to children in a way that like ancient Assyria doesn't. And I think that's because of, of the hieroglyphs being in many ways like recognizable pictures. Um, so you don't tend to get children's books that reproduce those little kind of um, more angular, let's face it, harder to read um, cuneiform text. But because you can read a hieroglyphic text, even if you can't read the actual writing, you can say, well, that's a cow and that's a bird and that's, um, that's a wiggly line which represents water. There's something, um, there's something rewarding in looking at it, even to somebody who isn't educated in that language. Um, and actually, um, I think we see, uh, expanding on your question, Grace, I think we see both. I think we see in this book, there is something about those children being good little colonial subjects um, because they go to Egypt and they go back to pre-dynastic Egypt and find that the pre-dynastic Egyptians are all kind of Aryan. And we also go back to Atlantis and see the kind of, um, I suppose, the origin point of a mythological version of European culture, which which again is very much white, as opposed to actually recognizing um, Egypt and the Near East as you know, culturally diverse and predominantly non-white cultures. Um, but I do think there are texts which are a little bit less um, kind of trying to mold children um, into seeing a kind of cultural British superiority. I think there are some which do have ancient Egyptian protagonists which use hieroglyphs in um, really inventive ways. There's a really nice book called Tom Catapus um, and Potiphar, which is about um, Potiphar as a, as a child and he and his cat go out and catch a fish for their dinner. And it's represented in text and in pictures, but also in hieroglyphs. And the hieroglyphs aren't real, of course, but they're like little tiny images of the cat with a little fish hook on his tail to catch their tea. So I think in some of those more innocent texts, um, if there is a kind of imperialistic thrust behind them, it's harder to detect, but we can definitely detect it in this bit. Um, I couldn't say about Horrible Histories because it's been a while since I read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, I think we've had another question as well, which is quite, quite open-ended, but who would have purchased these books by Nesbitt? Would they have been acquired by parents or would they be libraries and um, schools maybe? Good, very interesting question. Um, for Nesbitt's text, um, because it's originally published in the Strand, which is of course the venue that, um, you know, nowadays it's quite expensive to purchase the Strand, at least if it's got Sherlock Holmes in it, that's what it's famous for. Um, it is a kind of family magazine in a way, like the parents would be buying it definitely, um, but there'd be stuff in there that's, that's for kids. And so I think um, if you're one of the original uh, people buying this, you, if you were a parent, you'd be reading the story of the amulet in installments to your children, definitely. Um, the novel version is going to be more expensive because the strand was, was quite affordable. Um, so the novel version's definitely gonna be a bit more expensive. So probably a kind of middle-class audience, um, but it's likely that that novel was held by lending libraries as well. So um, it's not the case that you have to buy it to read it necessarily, you could borrow it, I would imagine. Mm, that is very interesting. And I guess it makes sense in terms of when we think about the commercial aspect of these texts and um, their, the Victorians' engagement with these objects, there is a real commercialization, I think. <laughs> Could yeah, you absolutely. That, sure. Um, I mean, actually, Grace's um, Egyptology book that um, she remembered, which I also remember fondly, you know, it's it really um, draws the eye. It's not real gold, obviously, but it's covered in foil and like a big fake plastic gemstone in the middle. And there's something, maybe something less plasticky, um, but there's something about um, the cover of the story of the amulet. You might have noticed that gold foil on the cover. So there is something of that little eye-catching, luxurious quality um, to the way the book as artifact is presented. And I think if there's one thing that still captures the imagination about ancient Egypt, you know, if you just look at how um, exhibitions are presented as well, 
or TV shows. It's always kind of things like Tombs of the Golden Pharaohs or Treasures of Tutankhamun. So it's all about gold and it's all about treasure still because that's what sells. Um, and I think there is something really visually appealing about that gold coverage, the way it catches the eye because um, it catches the light. Um, you can just imagine like if you were a Victorian or Edwardian mum, technically, walking past bookstores and your kids like pulling on your skirt saying, mum, buy me that, buy me that. Who would look so pretty. It's got a mummy on the front. Um, you can see that it's still part of that consumer culture, which still feels quite familiar to us. Yeah. And I think it taps into that idea of collecting as well. Definitely. Yeah. If you even if you can't afford an ancient artifact to put on your shelf, you can afford that book that replicates the ancient Egyptian like beautiful art object. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. And um, we've had another question from Noah. He says, "Thank you for a fascinating talk. By the way, there's lots of positive feedback coming through, so do check that out." <laughs> Um, going back to Noah's question, he says, the relation of text to form within sculpture is a main focus of my research. You've discussed cultural imperialism within museum artifacts in both the works referenced. I'm interested to know what you feel about the power of stone, textual and sculptural artifacts to transmit cultural knowledge when they are encountered in their original setting and how this knowledge might be translated without removal to a Western museum. Mm, intriguing. Um, I suppose the artifacts that can't be removed, you know, people have, people have gone to such expensive lengths um, to remove things from their original um, context. So you think about um, Cleopatra's needle, for instance, you know, people, people died trying to get that from, from Egypt to Britain. Um, the things that can't be transported are the things that are too big, usually. Some people tra um, transport really big things. But I, th I guess um, if we're looking at um, textually inscribed sculptural monuments like the Sphinx, which can't and shouldn't and won't be moved. Um, I suppose an encounter, an encounter with them in their original context, it's difficult, it's difficult to get that original context. I think um, photographs of the pyramids nowadays are taken from one angle because if you um, if you look from any other angle, it's built up and it's hotels and it's the tourism industry. So I think in a way you will never get that original context back. Um, but I think there's certainly something about um, the original site as far as you can, can capture it, which may well aid in the communication of meaning um, in a way that that context is destroyed and perhaps lost forever once once it's removed. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, the replica of Tutankhamun's tomb because um, it's got to the stage that I think it's the tourist's breath. Actually, I think it's the the water vapor in um, in exhalation, which, if the tomb is kept open, is just going to damage um, the paintwork and damage the inscriptions. And so, even in these original or, or as close to original contexts as you can get. Sometimes actually the replica um, comes closer to a to a, a I guess an authentic experience. Um, I'm not answering that question very well, <laughs> but it's a very complicated question. <laughs> no, I think that's a really formulated answer. <laughs> um, we've got another question from Nick, and he says, "How common is the theme of time traveling to ancient Egypt in literature of the 19th century for children versus adults?" That's really interesting. Um, I think this is actually one of the earliest examples of time travel to ancient Egypt and children's lit, if not the earliest example. Um, you do get it in earlier time travel fictions um, for adults. Uh, so it's definitely there from earlier in the 19th century. And I'm thinking as well, um, you know, even texts where you don't time travel to ancient Egypt, um, they're almost being marketed as if you do, because ancient Egypt is, is so glamorous and, and interesting and, um, and it's going to sell. So if you look at um, the first edition covers of H.G. Wells's The Time Machine, um, Wells's time traveler just goes to the future. He doesn't go to, to the ancient past. Um, but if you look at the cover, it's a kind of beigey, sandy colored cover and on it is imprinted an Egyptian looking Sphinx. And so I think um, the way that time travel narratives are marketed, even if 
you don't go back to ancient Egypt is you see the cover and it grabs you because you think this is going to be an ancient Egyptian story. Um, there are definitely more examples of time travel back to ancient Egypt. And there's actually, um, in the early 20th century, you start to get um, narratives where ancient Egyptians themselves are the time travelers and come to the present slash their future, I suppose, um, which is kind of interesting. But I would say it's not just for kids. Um, I think nowadays, I guess because ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian stuff is taught to kids in schools, that we see it as very much a subject in which children are interested. Um, but it's definitely also as much, not more so, a subject in which adults are interested, um, at least in fiction. Um, but I, I suppose, um, you know, even in the 19th century, if you, um, if you read accounts of the British Museum and who's going to the British Museum, um, it's the it's the mummy room, the room with the ancient Egyptian mummies, um, which is the most popular room. And then, as now, the children seem to have a kind of morbid fascination um, with mummified bodies of the ancient Egyptian dead as well. So it's not something that's unchild friendly. It's very much something that has appealed to children for like hundreds of years. <laughs> okay, I think that actually brings us quite nicely to. The idea, well, circling back to the idea of imperialism and the imperialist ramifications of these objects being in Europe. Um, I was wondering if you have found any accounts of people from Egypt, for example, who are visiting these museums and seeing these objects in these new settings and what they made of it. I haven't actually encountered um, any accounts of Egyptians traveling to the British Museum and describing it. Um, but I think there is, certainly even if you look at museums in Egypt, they're very much kind of um, imperialist institutions where the guys who are running the collections are either British or French, or I guess that's, it branches out into other European nationalities, but definitely still, um, it's a world which is dominated by um, American or European, usually men. Um, there is a change over the course of the late 19th century into the 20th century where um, Egyptians become more and more um, involved in the curation of their own ancient heritage. Um, but I think some people would read that with skepticism as, as um, still very much a kind of European practice um, of museum curation um, and removing of the, the artifacts from there they're kind of, eight, I guess, original ancient spaces. And certainly we see um, by the end of the 19th century, which we don't necessarily see at the beginning of the 19th century, is more of an increasing sense that people, whether that's Egyptians or whether that's Europeans, think that especially the, the mummified remains of the dead should be left where they are instead of being put in museums. Um, which I think is so interesting because it's still something that people very passionately debate. Um, there are good reasons, you know, there's good arguments for, for the removal of the bodies so that they can be kept in a safe place where, um, you know, moisture levels and temperature is all recorded and so that people um, don't have to post kind of security guards at tombs as a kind of 24 hour presence. Um, but, you know, also a fantastic counter argument that to remove these bodies of real people from where they wanted to, to have their bodies interred. Um, is to deny them their final wishes. So it, it is a difficult one. Um, and I think this is why there's no answers to these questions, you know, over a hundred years on, there, there's no simple solution. Um, but yes, very much a sense that, um, perhaps actually, I think, I think let's say things changed in the 1920s where, where Egyptian objects are no longer removed from Egypt as standard, we start to see, um, a, a kind of increased uh, European, um, Egyptian rather, control of Egypt's own heritage, which I think is, is only seen as a positive thing nowadays. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions, so if anyone wants to ask something, please do type it into the chat box and we'll get to it very quickly. Um, a question from Claire has just come in. She says, we've had quite a few examples of Victorian and Ed Edwardian writers going to museums, particularly the British Museum, and writing about the artifacts they've seen there today. You also mentioned the earlier precedents of Shelley and Wordsworth. 
Is there a particular Victorian phenomenon, do you think, or are there more recent examples? Another good question. <laughs> oh, there's some lovely, um, there's some lovely modern recent examples of poets who go to the British Museum and are interested in in kind of challenging um, uh, from a very kind of explicit anti-imperialist um, angle um, the fact that these objects are there. Um, so yeah, still poetry being written about the British Museum. Um, there's a beautiful example, and I wish I could remember the poet's name, but there's a, a lovely example I saw online the other day, which was a um, I guess as an example of what somebody earlier referred to as concrete poetry. So a poem in the shape of something um, where the form and the actual shape of the poem is, is um, as significant as, as its meaning, um, which is in the shape of the Rosetta Stone. Um, uh, it will come to me later, I'm sure, but it is, um, it's a beautiful poem, um, which replicates not just the shape of the Rosetta Stone as artifact, but also it splits the text into kind of three stanzas, I suppose, that kind of mimic the three different types of script. Um, so there are still examples. I think one of the ways in which the, the poetic tradition has changed is that certainly if you look at the early 19th century, who got to go to the British Museum was much more controlled than it is now. Um, so it's predominantly um, middle or upper class men who were kind of going there. Um, there were uh, debates in the newspapers around the middle of the century um, as to whether women or the working class should go to the museum, should be allowed in the museum. Um, and I think if we're familiar with the British Museum now, we see it as, you know, one of the great things about the British Museum is you can walk in, whoever you are, you don't need to book, you don't need to pay, you can make a donation. Um, but it's, it's, very, um, it's very open in contrast to, to how it was before. Um, and so I think what you see with, ah yes, Tate Standage is the Rosetta Stone poem. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, it's nice to be able to cite <laughs> the poet. Um, but I think certainly with the Romantic poets, we get an elite, we get an elite culture of, you know, these canonical writers, um, these writers who have the time, the space and the money to like go to museums and be inspired, whereas like all the ordinary people are working their jobs. And, you know, after a hard work, day's work, do you go to the British Museum? and think about sculpture and get inspired? Or do you just like go home and feed your kids? Um, so I think we do see a kind of democratization of access to the museum, which um, is still producing like amazing and, and really interesting poetry. So I think that's a good thing. That's a nice trajectory, hopefully. That's great. I think that's actually quite a nice place to finish off. Um, Thank you so much, Ellie, for coming in and presenting. It's been great to ha have you here and to hear from you about your research. Um, everyone's saying applause, so that's nice. Oh, um, please do look up the chat box, because I think there's some really lovely thoughts and comments there. Um, on behalf of everyone, I just want to say thank you. I'm going to hand over to Claire Fisher to close up. But just before I do, I think that this this keynote is actually a really nice connection to the DCR Summer Symposium. So I just want to flag up that recordings are available on the website. If you're interested in looking at the Rosetta Stone and thinking about Egypt, imperialism, anti-imperialism, decoloniality, then do check it out. So thank you again, Ellie, that was great.